Welcome back to Make, Build, Modify. I'm Justin, and today I want to go over framing squares. I want to go over all the charts and all the little marks and mystery numbers, and in the end, I want to show you some drawing tricks and some things you can do with circles. So let's get to it. When you're working with another carpenter and you're using a framing square and they're calling out measurements, it's good that both carpenters have a clear idea of the reference points on the square and their names for the parts of the square. The larger portion is considered the body and the smaller portion is considered the tongue and the outer corner is considered the heel. The tongue is 16 inches from the heel to the end and it's an inch and a half wide and the body is 24 inches from the heel to the end and it's two inches wide. There's a face and a back to a framing square and you can tell it's face up when you see the number, the tool number stamped in the heel area of the square. You can also have the body in your left hand and the tongue in your right hand with the corner facing away and you know you have it face up. The opposite, it'll be face down. Along the edges of the square, you'll see subdivisions. They differ depending on what edge you're using front and back. In this case, there's sixteenths noted on the two outer edges and eighths noted on the inner edges. On the steel square, it's the same, it's just not noted. And on the blue square that I have, it's flopped. You've got eighths and sixteenths on inner and outer edges. Let's flip them over and take a look at the other scales. There are twelfths on the outer edge of the tongue and the body, and tenths on the inner edge of the tongue, and sixteenths on the inner edge of the body. Twelfths are very handy for scaling plans. If you have a set of plans that are one inch on the plans for every foot in reality, then each one of these delineations will be an inch on the plans. Also, if it's a quarter inch per foot on the plans, then each delineation would be four inches in reality. So that's very handy. Tenths works for engineering plans where the measurements are listed in decimal form. And there are also some other things on the square that give you decimal format answers that you need the tenth scale to use those so you don't have to convert back to fractions to be able to get those measurements correct. The Steel framing square has a very handy feature that's not seen very often, at least I haven't seen it very often. It's a hundredth scale. And what you would use this for is stepping off literally hundredths of an inch with your dividers to get an accurate measurement. And there are lines for every hundredths in this. The brace scale is a series of numbers listed on the back side of the tongue, and they have to do with finding the length of a knee brace for a beam and post. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's a drawing of two posts and a beam and here's a knee brace. And in this case we measure 48 over and 48 up and we have a knee brace that's 67 inches and 88 hundredths of an inch. And that's what this chart does. It gives you this diagonal measurement. Let's look at 48 right here. 48 inches over, 48 inches up, 67 inches and 88 hundredths of an inch. So if you take any of these measurements, 36 over and 36 up, and you get 50 inches and 91 hundredths of an inch. Also, you can use these for a larger square. So if you're measuring over 48 and up 48, you can measure 67 and 88 hundredths of an inch on a diagonal, and you can tell that your two members are square to each other. It's another way of creating a larger square than a framing square for checking your rooms, your walls, things like that. If you need to get the hundredths, then what you use is this hundredths scale and step it off. So you'd measure out, for example, in the 48, 48, 67, you would measure out 67 inches and then you would get your dividers out, step off 88 hundredths, and you would add it to your 67 and you would have the appropriate length for your knee brace. This is the board foot chart. It allows you to find the volume in board feet of any given plank within the limits of the chart. Let me show you what a board foot is so you understand what the chart's all about. This is one board foot, 12 inches wide, 12 inches long, and one inch tall. It's a measure of volume. And it's important for figuring how much lumber you're going to use for a project. Knowing that a piece of wood that's 12 inches wide and 12 inches long is one board foot, and you know that it's eight feet long, it's gonna be eight board feet. If it's nine feet long, it's nine board feet, and so on. If you have a plank that is, say, five inches at eight feet long, you go over to your 12 inch to find out the foot length, eight feet long, it's the first row. You go over to your five, and you see that you have 
three board feet and four twelfths of a board foot. The number on the left is the number of board feet. The number on the right is twelfths of a board foot. Let's do another one. Eight, let's say you have a plank that's eight inches wide and 14 feet long. So you go to 12, 14 is one up from the bottom, go back to eight, eight inch plank, one up from the bottom, nine board feet and four twelfths of a board foot. You may have noticed that there is no 12 in this column. And that's because any board of any width that's 12 feet long is its own width in board feet. For example, if you have a plank that's eight inches wide, one inch thick, and 12 feet long, it's eight board feet. If you have a plank that's 10 inches wide, one inch thick, and 12 feet long, it's 10 board feet. Because of this, they left that row out so they could add another row for the carpenter to use for other figures. The board foot chart can also be used for multiplication. You use the numbers that coincide with the columns and you use the numbers that are in the twelves column for the factors. So for example, if you want to measure if you want to multiply 15 times 15, you would use the bottom row and the 15 column and you would get 18 foot 9. And you just pull out your tape measure to 18 foot 9 and it's 225. Let's do another one. Let's say we want to multiply 11 times 14. So you'd go down to the fourth row, go over to 14, and you get 12 foot 10. And again, you pull your tape measure out to 12 foot 10. 12 foot 10, 154. This newer blue square doesn't have the board foot chart like this black square does. Instead, they've replaced it with a bunch of other helpful charts, and I'll go over those really quickly. This chart is designed for counting studs, joists, or rafters, anything that's running on a 16-inch center. And what it gives you is the stud count on the left and the plate length on the right. So let's do eight, and I'll show you how it works. So you start with your tape measure. First stud is at the end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's at nine foot four inches. And every single one of these has the same relationship. You can go all the way out to a 40 count wall that's 52 feet long. This is a conversion chart for inches to feet in decimal format. So 12 inches is one foot, 11 inches is 0.92 feet, and so on all the way down to an eighth of an inch. This chart converts the roof pitch over two degrees. So you can use your protractor to mark your lumber or your chop saw, set your chop saw to cut your lumber. The numbers on the left are the roof pitch, the numbers on the right are the degrees. This is a pilot hole wood screw chart. It gives you this wood screw size on the left and the pilot hole size in decimal inches on the right. This is a fractional to decimal conversion chart for inches, 1 32nd all the way up to 15 16 These little dots along the face of the tongue are called the octagon scale and they allow you to draw an octagon from a square. And it's a pretty easy process. Let me show you how to do it. Let's do an eight inch square. So first we have to mark our square out. You have to mark the middle of each side. And the next step is to count out eight dots. This is an eight inch square, so you count out eight dots. So there's five, six, seven, eight. You go from the middle of each side of the square and draw a line like that. And then you connect the lines. And there's an octagon. This is it. This is the last table we're going to go over on the framing square. After that, I'm going to show you some cool drawing tricks. This is called the rafter tables. And it goes over commonly used increments for cutting roofs. So a roof, carpenter, roof framing carpenter would use this. I'm not going to get into the tables too much for roof framing because that's outside the scope of this video. But if you are going to cut roofs, you will end up probably buying a roof framing book and it'll refer to this chart in that book. Most of them do. So let's say you want to build a little roof, a little doghouse roof. And the roof is 24 inches across. This is called the span. And this section here to here 
would be 12 inches. That's called the run. And this section is the rise from here to here. So let's say that you have an 8 inch rise. That would make this roof 8 inches of rise for 12 inches of run or an 8-12 roof. And you'll see it marked like this on plans. If I wanted to find the distance, the length of this rafter, I would go to the square in the table. I would find the 8 inch number for 8 inch pitch. And I would find the top row, which is the common rafter. And I would see it's 14.42 inches. Now, if I wanted to make this roof 10 times larger, it would be 120 inches, 80 inches, and you move the decimal over here, and it would be 144.2 inches. That increment is designed to help you find the length of any rafter on any pitch on the scale. There's also a hip valley row, and the hips and valleys have a different run than a common run. So that increment is a little larger and you can see it changing throughout. There's also jack rafters and the side cut of rafters. I'm not going to get into those, but those are very useful for cutting roofs and important numbers to know. So this is a great cheat sheet for a roof cutter. It's good to know how to draw an equilateral triangle because the corners are 60 degrees in each corner. This is a quick technique with a square to get to that if you don't have a compass. First you draw a baseline just for reference. Then you draw a 90 degree mark to that. Let's make this one 18 inches wide. So from one side of the line, I'm going to go 9 inches. And from the other side of the line, I'm going to go 9 inches. So now you take the heel of your square, line it up on your mark, and you swing until 18 inches passes through the line here. And you do the same thing here. What's neat about this is this being 60, this is 90, and this is 30. When you're using a drawing triangle, it matches. So it's another useful way of getting those angles if you don't have one of these. This one's really cool. This one gives you the circumference of a circle based off the diameter of a circle. So to start, you draw a baseline. You slide your square up to that line. Mark 7 inches. Go up here, mark 22 inches. Take a straight edge and draw through those two lines. This relationship, a seven inch circle has a 22 inch circumference. Now if we slide the square down to say six, that relationship is constant. So if we line this up correctly, I'm gonna guess this is saying about 18.8 .8 or so. Let's do the math. 18.84, not bad. Let's do five. Slide the square over to five inch mark right here. Make sure the baseline's lined up well. Find where this line comes through. Maybe 15.7, let's check it. Not bad, pretty close. This is a really good trick for finding the surface area of a circle that is equal to the area of two smaller circles. And you would wanna use this for HVAC where maybe you're finding the volume of ducts and you wanna size a duct to match the other two smaller ducts. Basically what you need to know is the diameter of the two smaller circles. So let's just call this one eight and this one 12. Now what you do is go up eight inches on one portion of the square and 12 inches over on the other, and you measure the diagonal. In this case, 14.4, roughly. So that creates the diameter of this one. Matter of fact, I think that's on the framing square for an 812 pitch, yes, 14.42. Now, we can figure the area. Now let's see how close these are. 1.6. 3.31, subtract 50.26 from that, 113.05, and that's pretty close to the other number here. You can use this method with any two sized circles. It doesn't have to be both 8 and 12. It could be any inch increment. Matter of fact, it could be anywhere on the rule, and it'll give you the third circle. And you can use this with triangles, rectangles, and squares as long as you use like sides. It's the same relationship. Okay, this is the last one. I'm going to show you how to draw a circle with a square. First, draw a line for reference, and let's draw like a 12-inch circle. Mark 12 inches on the line. This is the diameter of the circle. Now you take nails, set those on those marks, 
and I'm gonna use a Sharpie so you can see it. Place the Sharpie in the corner, the inside corner of the square, and you're gonna swing the square around and keep pressure on the nails. And there's a circle. Thanks for watching, guys. There are some good framing squares linked in the description, and if you think I've earned it, please subscribe.